All right, welcome back to Essential Perturbation Theory and Asymptotic Analysis. Uh, do you guys have any questions before we get started? All right, we're going to finish slide deck for the slide deck for chapter three. I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time in this uh, in this proof that we're going to do. Uh, I just want you to be aware of it and. Um, I'm going to show you this sort of heuristic derivation and then uh, the the rigorous version of that. But again, we're not going to worry too much about the rigorous uh, case. The most important part is uh, if you know how to apply and use the method. All right. Uh, so we're talking about the method of stationary phase, and that is a method for analyzing the asymptotic behavior as lambda gets large goes to infinity of the following Fourier integral. So the interval of integration is a to b. So it's uh, it's a real integral, but it has uh, a kernel which is possibly complex, so it can be divided into real and imaginary parts. For the moment, we, we can just assume that f is a continuous function or something like that into the real numbers. It could be a complex valued function. But uh, for the most part, these are functions of a real variable and we multiply them together, they're complex valued. Notice that the kernel has an oscillatory part. So it's an e to the i lambda uh, psi of t. Psi is a real value. Uh, real valued function in this case. So I times lambda times psi of T is complex, purely imaginary. And so that's uh, using Euler's formula, we can show that that's just a, a cosine uh, of the angle plus I times the sine of the angle. Now we're gonna assume that there's a point of stationary phase. And remember we saw that at points of stationary phase, the oscill oscillations sort of calm down. And around the points of stationary phase, we can do some asymptotics by assuming that everything else is going to be of a higher order in, as lambda goes to infinity. We're going to assume that we have a point of stationary phase that's inside of AB, not at one of the endpoints, but in the interior. And that means that there's a that the derivative at T naught is equal to zero. And we're going to assume to be specific that the derivative is non-zero everywhere else in, the, in that interval. In fact, we're going to assume that the second derivative is uh, positive at the stationary point. So this means that this is a point of stationary phase of order one. Okay, in the in the according to the definition that we gave earlier. All right. So as above, what we start by doing is um, breaking the integral of interest into pieces. So one where we're integrating over a small neighborhood around the point of stationary phase T naught and integrals uh, away from this point of stationary phase. And these are the integrals that I call the tails. And I, I guess I still have uh, failed to fix this part. In fact, I went back to check to see what typos that I had highlighted and I had already deleted this set of notes from my notability. So this shouldn't be here. Now, um, so we have the integral of interest and then the two tails and the two tails we argue are order one over lambda as lambda gets large. That's okay as long as this, um, this integral here is of a lower order, okay? So in other words, this part is not gonna be neglected, but these two parts can be. All right, so that's what we're saying here by the riemann lebesgue lemma. I, this is another thing I wanna correct. We don't want references here. By the generalized riemann lebesgue lemma, we argue that these two integrals are both order lambda inverse, reciprocal of lambda as lambda gets large because the functions are otherwise nice there. So for that for that uh, generalized Riemann-Lebesgue lemma, we needed this guy to be to have no derivatives equal to zero 
uh, in this interval of integration. And so that's the that's the case here by by definition, by assumption. So both of those tails are order lambda inverse. That must mean that the thing we're going to keep is of a lower order, okay? In fact, we're going to show that the contribution in the center is of order lambda to the power minus one half. Okay, so lower, that's a lower order term. We need to keep that term. All right, so let's see how this goes. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is a, something that I glossed over because when we went through this too quickly last time. The first approximation that I'm going to make is I'm going to assume that it's okay for me in this interval to just replace F's value, okay, the, the function F by its value at the point of stationary phase. And of course, that'll be okay as long as F isn't equal to zero, maybe. Um, that that makes sense. If f is a continuous function, then, then it has point values. So we're going to assume that this is non-zero and we can approximate the whole integral by replacing f with its value at the point of stationary phase. Everything else is, is it remains, uh, well, no, okay. We are also making the approximation by replacing this with its second order Taylor approximation. Now, remember the first derivative is uh, at the point of stationary phase is zero. So that doesn't appear. Only the zeroth order and the second order terms appear. Okay, so we did do actually two replacements there. And now, of course, this doesn't depend on the integration variable, so it can come out, as does this term here. It doesn't depend on the integration variable. So that guy comes out. Now, that does depend on lambda. So that's going to contribute to our asymptotic approximation. All right, but now this thing here, um, we could integrate this thing, but the limits of integration are not necessarily convenient. So let's make them more convenient by a change of variables and also by increasing the limits from from uh, finite values to plus and minus infinity, arguing that if we make that change, we're only going to incur errors of the size of one over, uh, I think in this case, what what is the size of this error? This one actually might be transcendentally small errors. Actually, no. Let's see, is that true? That I actually need to think about that one. If, what what is the er what is the effect of increasing this? In this one, is it transcendentally small errors, or is it just one over uh, one over lambda error? I think it's actually transcendentally small errors, but I, I need I need to I need to think about that and check that. But now, in any case, um, we can do a cha quick change of variables, replacing all this business by just uh, s or s squared, I guess. So then we're integrating over an infinite interval. Uh, e to the minus, or sorry, e to the i s squared ds. Now, this is maybe a, a Gaussian, I'll put it in air quotes, a Gaussian type of integral that you haven't seen before. This one should be done by, or this one can be done by doing a contour integration argument, but it's, it's, it's related to its cousin, the standard Gaussian integral. Um, in any case, uh, we can show that that has that integral is finite and just gives this value. Okay. Now, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Now, so when we did that change of variables, we got this contribution in terms of lambda. So this is lambda to the minus one half power. So that's where this, the fulfillment of this comes from. This, of course, is just oscillatory. Right, just just providing oscillatory information, and so this guy, if it's if everything is correct, really is giving us something which is order lambda to the minus one half power. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I guess I did argue that this error is the the 
the amount of error that I make by making this change, the sum total of that is just order lambda to the minus one. So I, yeah, I guess I believe that. But that this this part here could still be transcendentally small. It's just that this part here is order one over lambda. So we'll as we go through the proof of this, we'll we'll try to confirm those those assumptions, those hunches. So as a consequence, what we showed is that the difference between I and this approximation here is order lambda to the minus one power as lambda goes to infinity. Or in other words, the way you can write this is uh, I of lambda is asymptotic to this, okay? Which is easy enough to show just by a, a simple calculation, knowing that this is true. Now, this approximation, this asymptotic approximation is only a one-term approximation, and we cannot improve upon it according to the or according to this technique or using this technique, we cannot improve upon this approximation. However, there are other methods that we can use to improve the approximation of the method of stationary phase. And we're going to discuss those uh, probably about uh, the week after spring break, I would say. We'll finally get to that. And that, that method is called the method of steepest descents. But before we get to that method, we're going to talk a little bit about what's called complex contour integration, because I'm not assuming you guys have seen that before, and we'll do a quick little review of it. Okay. Now, the only um, things I want to point out is if f of t is equal to zero, you have to do something a bit different. And the other thing you need to worry about is we only did the case where t naught is a point of stationary phase in the interior of the integration interval. If it is um, at one of the endpoints of the integration interval, then you have to do something different. You have to do a different technique. And I'll give a I'll give a result for that, but I'm not going to prove it. So questions before we go on to the rigorous proof. So by rigorous proof here, I mean, once again, a proof by calculation, but where we keep track of how we do calculation, how the value of certain limits, the value of certain integrations. Actually, I will, I will confess that there, there is a bit more technical, there is a bit more to the technical side of this, this coming proof than uh, in previous proof by calculations, but it's not too much more. Okay, so the first thing I need to know is a, a technical lemma. So let me state this and I'll show you where we use this in the proof. So the proof that I'm talking about is this uh, stationary, this is the theorem uh, um, related to the stationary phase. We're gonna prove rigorously and I need a little technical lemma to get us through. So suppose that H from D to C is an analytic function on the open set D, which is a subset of the complex plane. So an analytic function we're going to see in the next chapter means that it is differentiable in the complex sense. So complex derivatives are a bit different than real derivatives. And uh, in fact, they're a, a bit more powerful. Okay, so this open set in the complex plane contains the finite real interval A to B. So the picture is something like this. So there's our set D. And it contains this interval A to B. Now, to be honest, um, now that I'm thinking about it, we may need to have a little bit more assumptions about D maybe that it's uh, additionally simply connected. So something like this, something like a disk, all right? Doesn't have any holes in it, for example. Um, maybe we need that. Um, I'm not sure exactly. All right, so we're gonna assume that this D is open, but sim uh, sufficiently nice. Um, it's a subset of the complex plane. So remember, the real line is just a part of the complex plane. In fact, in the complex plane, we have the real axis and we have the imaginary axis, okay? And we'll talk more about that in the next chapter as well. 
This is the picture of this set D in any case. And we're going to suppose that H, when it's confined to this, this real interval A to B, is also real valued. We're going to assume that H prime of T is equal to zero for exactly one point, T naught, in A, B. And we're going to assume that H double prime of T naught is equal to um, alpha, and that alpha is positive. Then for some delta, again, this is a... It's, it's called a technical lemma for a reason. It's, it's because it's complicated, and but it's going to give us some sort of information that we can use later. We're not going to worry about the proof of it. So for some delta, there is an analytic function W, which uh, maps this ball. This is what we call the closed ball of radius delta centered on T naught. So that's also something in the complex plane. Right, so this little ball here. So we're going to assume T naught is in the center, and then that ball is some closed subset of the complex plane. Well, closed disk in the complex plane, entirely contained inside of this bigger set D. Okay, such that W is real valued. So there exists some, an analytic function W such that W is also real valued, strictly increasing and continuous on this interval, T minus delta to T plus delta. So that's here to here. Okay, now this is, this the B is in the complex plane, but the thing we're interested in is just that segment of it in the on the real line. Strictly increasing and continuous and one-to-one -one on this set and H minus H of T naught is equal to W squared. So in other words, this W is like an inverse of this function, okay? So this W is a one-to-one -one inverse of this function, but only locally near this point, okay? Near the point T naught. So here's the picture. Okay, so I have um, T naught. And uh, so what did we assume about this guy? This point, uh, okay, so H goes kind of like that, right? At T naught, at T naught, its derivative is zero, okay? And, it's, um, oh, I, I made that, drew the curve in the wrong direction. So it looks like that. How do we know that? Because um, the second derivative is positive and it's equal to this uh, value alpha right here, okay? So what I'm saying is there's a one-to-one -one function W such that this guy, this W is essentially overlapping this guy here. Let's uh, write it in blue. Okay, so that if I square W, I just get an overlap of that function. But the function W is itself one-to-one, -one, which means that if I, so this is what I'm plotting there in blue is W squared. Okay, so that's W squared. W itself around T naught might look something like this. It's a one-to-one -one function. It looks basically like a little line. All right? So that's like saying I'm ha I have this function. <clears throat> if you want to view it like this, is this W function is somehow like the square root of this function. Okay? And it's one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to need that at some point uh, in what follows. I guess I should have said also for this guy, for this all to make sense, I really need to say that actually T naught is actually in the interior of the integration interval, right? Or the interval AB. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the endpoints. So I don't want that square. So square bracket 
I hope that you all know by um, set builder notation or set notation that this means that it includes the endpoints, whereas this notation means that I exclude the endpoints. Okay, so I'll show you where that's going to be, where that comes up. Remember, we're trying to do things rigorously, but we're not going to supply every single detail. Okay, so suppose that A, B are, A and B are finite numbers. I think this can be relaxed as well, but we're not going to worry about that. Suppose that P is um, P is an N. Let's see, do I need the P? I think I might have gotten rid of the P and forgot to eliminate it here. Yeah, that's a typo, right? Because I don't actually ever use P again. So you can scratch that out. Not necessary. We're only going to, in this theorem, we're only going to consider points of stationary phase of order one. I was going to originally write the inner, uh, the the uh, theorem for a generic P, and I decided against that. And just, I, I decided to state a corollary or a, um, a follow-up theorem for that case. So you can eliminate that P. All right. A uh, lambda, as usual, is uh, a parameter between zero and infinity, and we're going to think about lambda getting larger. Assume that f and uh, f and and psi are complex analytic in an open disk that contains the interval a b, such that their restrictions, uh, the, or at least the restriction of psi to a b, is real valued. I don't want I don't want psi to be complex valued because that messes up what I have here. I want this to be purely complex because these two, the product of these two are purely real. Okay, purely imaginary in, in other words. We're gonna further assume that T naught is a point of stationary phase that's in the interior. So this one is definitely in the interior and it's gonna be of order one. So initially I said it was gonna be of order P, it's not. And that is, we're going to uh, assume that uh, psi prime at T naught is equal to zero, point of stationary phase, and psi double prime, uh, this is also a typo here, that should be T naught. Psi double prime at T naught is equal to alpha. Okay, very important. So two errors on this one. All right, so then what, we're, what we can show is the integral the Fourier integral that we're interested in, this guy here, is asymptotic to f of t naught. So just evaluate f at the point of stationary phase times the square root of two pi over alpha times lambda. So that's our one over lambda to the one half power or lambda to the minus one half power contribution. And then a and, a, and then a piece which is oscillatory in nature, right? E to the I lambda psi T naught plus pi over four. And the pi over four comes from that Gaussian-like complex integration that we talked about. All right, if on the other hand, this, uh, oh gosh, more mistakes. That's because I always copy paste, right? T naught, if, Psi prime of T naught is equal to zero and psi double prime of T naught is equal to alpha, which is strictly negative, then the formula is exactly the same, except that you have to change this guy to a minus alpha in the denominator. Okay. And it's otherwise, oh, and then one other place you change this to a minus. Okay, so how does this how does this proof work out? So I'm going to follow the proof from Marsden and Hoffman. This is a a book on complex analysis that I really like. It's an older book. It's from 1987, but it's quite nice. It has a newer edition, but <clears throat> in the newer edition, which I think is the third edition, they took out some of the asymptotic analysis stuff, which is which I didn't like, but uh, otherwise it's a nice book. All right, so we're going to assume for the sake of simplicity that alpha, we're dealing with the alpha greater than zero case, and we're going to leave this... Um, to the to the reader, but I claim that the alpha less than zero case is similar. 
Now using our technical lemma, we can replace, we can do a change of variable, just like I said, uh, we can replace psi minus psi of t naught uh, equal to w squared, where w is some uh, one to one function, at least uh, in a small interval around t naught. So that's going to be an interval of length delta. And so we're going to contract our attention to that um, to that interval. Well, I guess it's uh, the radius is delta. So uh, the, the, the diameter is two delta. In any case, we're going to restrict our integral of, or our attention to this integral t minus delta to t plus delta of f of t e to the i lambda uh, times psi of t dt. Okay, so we're just going to concentrate on this part. And we'll do as we always do and argue that the the part outside of that using the riemann lebesgue lemma is just going to be uh, of order lambda to the minus one. In other words, the, the tail, the tail, the two tail parts. Okay, so those can be neglected because we're going, hopefully they can be neglected because we're going to show that this guy is order lambda to the minus one half. Any questions so far? Okay. So we're going to make a change of variable. We're going to change to the variable x. Um, is that the variable I want to do? I think I might have a typo in this one. So let's see if this makes sense. No, it's okay. So we're, we're, we're just gonna do the, the change of variable X equals WT. So that means, uh, and we're gonna set the value C to be equal to WT minus uh, Delta. And uh, D to be WT plus delta. So if we do that change of variable, so this corresponds, the C corresponds to um, T minus T naught minus delta, and the D corresponds to T naught plus delta. Okay. Um, and so we can show that then the integral becomes on I delta E to the I lambda psi of T naught. So we're doing that replacement. Okay. So What's happening here is we're saying what is inside is just this. So we really do this replacement. We have psi of t equals to uh, w squared of t uh, plus lambda t naught. Okay, so that's the first replacement we're going to do. And that's why this guy comes out front. The second replacement is just a straightforward replacement of X with WT. And now when we do this replacement, we have to take care of uh, change of variables formula. So the change of variables formula means that we have to replace, um, well, you know, when we, we re when we replace the, the DT with DX, keeping in mind that this guy is invertible, right? That's the important part there, that this is an invertible function, W. That's by our little technical lemma. Then all of this gets replaced in this change of variables formula by G of X equals F of W inverse. So it's complicated, but it's not too bad. Times the ordinary derivative of W inverse DX evaluated at the point X, okay? So it's a little bit of a complicated change of variables formula, but it works out when I do this replacement here. So notice that what I'm doing here is saying that by this replacement, uh, T is equal to W inverse of X. And of course, then I have to find out what D T D X is, right? D T D X. That's got to be d by dx of w inverse of x. And so it's that change of variables formula that I'm talking about. 
So dt equals d by dx, w inverse x, um, times uh, dx. And I guess I want to, let's see, to replace. And then, then all this is, is um, using the, the derivative, uh, the derivative formula for derivatives of inverses. Okay, so you can check this, but um, I'm not going to dwell too much more on it, that this is the formula that you get after the change of variables. Okay, as we said, we use the fact that W is invertible, but maybe only in a small interval. Okay, so the point T equals T naught corresponds to X equals zero. That's the way we set things up. And we need to calculate this guy, psi double prime t naught. That works out to be two time based on our little formula here. That's two w at t naught times w second derivative at t naught plus two times w prime t naught squared. So where is that going to get used? That gets used in, in a replacement whenever we want to figure out what is the value of this, the uh, derivative of this inverse function evaluated at zero. We use what we just calculated to show that that equals, um, let's see, this one might be, do I have a typo there? Well, I'll have to check that later, but we won't dwell on it too much. That this value works out to be um, alpha over two, alpha, the the square root of alpha over two. So that g naught works out to be in the in the sum total at the end of the day works out to be f of t naught square root t over alpha. Now g prime is continuous, and g has Therefore, bounded variation can be written as the difference of two increasing functions. This is where it gets a little bit technical and maybe is only for the, math met, the mathematically inclined in the room. So a, a bounded variation function is uh, a function that you can always guarantee can be written as the difference of two increasing functions. Or if a function is a bounded variation, then you can guarantee that this always happens. And the reason why we're going to use this is because we're going to use a we're going to use um, uh, a let's see I forget what we call it I think it's the integral mean value theorem yeah second integral mean value theorem which is contained in the appendix to the notes okay now since uh, let's sorry let's let epsilon greater than zero be given. And uh, since C and D go to zero as delta goes to zero, right? As I make delta smaller and smaller, these C and D, which I define through the variable X, also are going to go to, they're going to converge to zero. By a technical limit in the appendix, again, something that you can look at in the appendix, there is a delta small enough so that G of G1 of C minus G1 of zero, G1 of D minus G1 of zero, G2 of C minus G2 of zero and G2 of D minus G2 of zero are all less than epsilon in size. So remember, these are all increasing functions. So actually I can, I, I know that uh, G1 of zero is bigger than G1 of C, et cetera. So I know the signs on all these differences, but really all I care about is the fact that I can make all of these differences small in size because they're all continuous increasing functions. So I can contract delta down small enough so that epsilon uh, can be bigger than all of these sums. Now, here's the integral that I'm working with now. So this one's the transformed integral. Okay, so this is the guy where, this is the I delta interval. We argued that the tails that we've dropped are order lambda to the minus one power. We're gonna work on this guy. So it turns out it's a little bit easier if we multiply this thing by, um, we multiply this integral by this prefactor. If we multiply by this prefactor, you can see right away that that gets rid of this. And if we multiply by this 
prefactor, well, this square root of lambda is going to come back to help us out momentarily. So J delta of lambda is equal to this new integral here. And again, all I've done is essentially drop this and replace it with that by multiplying by a, a prefactor. Now, remember we said that G, because it's a, it's a nice function, so it can be written as the difference of two increasing functions, G1 and G2. And the integral is a linear, is a linear thing. Right, so I can break the integral of that difference into the difference of two integrals. And I'm gonna operate on each one of them separately. By the second mean value theorem, okay, so this is maybe one that you haven't ever seen before. You may have seen the, sorry, it's the second integral mean value theorem. I'll show you exactly what it says, but you may not have ever seen this before. You may have only seen the first integral mean value theorem, uh, which is, goes, well, actually, I don't want to state it because I think I might screw it up. It's in the appendix, okay? The first and the second mean value, integral mean value theorems, quite useful things. I never remember them, so you shouldn't worry about whether you remember them either. Mm -hmm. By that second integral mean value theorem, there is a point mi in C to D. Remember, that's the integral over our new integral of integration such that when we look at the ith one, so remember each gi is an increasing function, and that's something that's uh, used in this integral, second integral mean value theorem, that I can replace this integrand in here with gi of c, but only if I integrate over from c to mi. Okay, so I can replace it with the left-hand side, and everything else remains the same in the integral, plus, the right-hand evaluation, g, times the same integral, but only the integral, or I guess the same integral, but on the interval of integration, mi to d. Otherwise, these integrals stay the same. Now let's do another change of variables. Change of variables are our friends, since we would do them all the time. So we're going to do the change of variable, set u equal to the square root of lambda times x. Okay, so we we were in x, we're going to go to back to, we're going to go to u now. Remember, this is the integral we said, that's that funny Gaussian type, and we want to pump this integral up by inflating these limits of integration. Okay, so the nice thing here is that both of these integrals, okay, these integrals here are the same, more or less. They just have different limits of integration. Okay. So we're going to use this known integral. That's the one that I spoke of earlier. This is this Gaussian-like integral. Notice that I don't have a minus sign here, but I do have the i. Is uh, square root of pi times e to the i pi over four. Now, I claim that taking lambda to infinity, what we're going to what we're going to find is that as we take lambda to, to infinity, uh, this guy, the limit of this one, okay, this, which is now shown to be that, to take the limit as lambda goes to infinity, what, I'm, what I claim we get is owing to that g function that appears out front, that's just this guy, and or this guy, I'm just get that, plus uh, this, this limit here. So now I want to show you why that that's true. Okay, why that's true. Well, the g function, the g i star function, is either going to be g i of c if m i is greater than zero, and it's going to be g i of d if m i is less than zero, and it'll be exactly half of those values if m i is right dead on in the middle, the center. And so you can show then. Um, that this integral holds, okay? And the reason is because, the reason that this holds in the limit is because essentially um, this integral limit here is going to go to uh, essentially minus infinity. And this one goes to plus infinity, okay? More or less, that's the idea. Okay, but now I have to pay attention as to whether mi is uh, 
on one side of the zero or the other. Okay, so that's what that's where this complicated uh, piecewise function comes in. We don't know exactly if mi is positive or it's negative or it's right on the center. Okay, so let's suppose that it is. Um, let's suppose that it's right on the center because that one is easy. So what happens in that case? Well, this is going to be zero, and this goes to minus infinity, right? And this one is going to be zero, and this goes to plus infinity. What about this value here? Well, that's a fixed value. It doesn't change at all, okay? So then you can use the fact that this is a cement, this has a this integral has a symmetry, and this integral has exactly the same in a, same symmetry. So that you, when you add these two together, you're just going to one half of this and this plus this value of the integral. Okay, each one contributes a half, and so that's what you get. Now, if it lies on one side, then we don't have to worry about the one of the others because let's suppose that mi is actually let's do this one. Suppose that mi is less than zero. All right. So here, if I take lambda to infinity. This guy is less than zero, because so this, this goes to minus infinity. This goes to plus infinity. So this gives me the whole integral that I showed here. Okay. Now, again, mi is negative. So this goes to minus infinity. This goes to minus infinity. You can show that essentially you're going to get an integral which contributes nothing. Okay. So that's the argument. Okay. So um, finally... We can put the two calculations together. We had to split them to use the second integral mean value theorem into increasing functions. Now we can put them back together. And so what we get when we put them back together is this limit. Okay, you've, you've got one contribution from G1 and one contribution from G2, but they have the same contribution otherwise, this guy here. Now, at the same time, if we take the limit as delta goes to zero, what can we show about these two things here, the sum of these guys here? Well, as delta goes to zero, that goes to g of zero. You can show that quite easily, but we already calculated g of zero. It's just this value. So we, you know, we did a couple of change of changes of variables, and we argued that if you evaluate it at, uh, I think it was. Um, was this this was x equals zero, then we get we get this value. So if we put everything together, then what we want is the limit. Um, we want to show that this limit here as the lambda times all this guy times i1 is just going to give us this. So now that this part here, if we only have the if we only have the part um, the the j delta interval, then remember what j delta was, the j delta integral, sorry. It's just this, okay? So basically we're picking up this i delta integral when we take that limit. When we multiply that times that, we're gonna split this i into i delta plus the two tails. Okay, so when I split it into the i delta part, then we have this. We already showed what the limit of this guy was. And now what about the limit of these two guys here? Well, if I multiply, so we said that this was order uh, one over lambda, but now I'm multiplying by something which is oscillatory and something which is square root of lambda. So that whole thing goes to order, uh, is something order lambda to the minus one half. So order one over lambda times something which is order um, lambda to the one half, if you multiply the two together, you get something which is order lambda to the minus one half, which eventually goes to zero. This guy was already cooked up so that we have this limit is just going to be all of this. This guy goes to zero. This guy is this limit here. So finally, at the end of the day, we can conclude that we can, we've proved what we wanted to show that I of lambda is equal to, or is asymptotic to F of T square root of two pi over lambda alpha. Again, this is the alpha positive case times uh, an oscillatory part. I think I'm missing a lambda here. There should be a lambda in there. 
the oscillatory part. And then this part is called the phase shift. This part here is what's called the phase shift, which is what we wanted to prove. Now, again, I'm not going to hang on every detail of that. Um, it's a complicated proof. Um, but if you're really interested in asymptotic analysis, I hope that you'll look over the details of this and convince yourself that this really is um, filling in, in a rigorous sense, all the details that we hand waved uh, previously. Are there any questions about that? And now I really don't want to go into any of the details of the higher order analysis, but you can um, you can fill that in. You can also analyze the case where the uh, the, the point of stationary phase is at an end point. That, that part isn't actually too difficult because you can kind of do the analysis where it's uh, in the middle and then take away half of it, essentially. All right, so suppose that um, A and B are finite. P is some positive integer greater than one. And um, lambda is, let's see. Yeah, okay, so I guess what I'm doing here is I'm generalizing in, along two fronts. So I'm allowing, um, I'm allowing P to be higher order. So that's the order of the, of the stationary phase point. And I'm also taking the, the or I'm also taking the case where the stationary phase point is an endpoint. All right. So if you do that, if the stationary phase point is of order p equals two, what does that mean? That means that the derivative. Um, well, let's do the let's do the um, case where it's order p first. So if it's order p, then it's derivative at a and all of its um, higher order derivatives up to and including the p minus first derivative at a at a are zero. And then if I look at the p derivative at a, I get alpha, which is greater than zero. I'm not going to generalize things to an absurd level, but you can also consider this alpha negative and you'll and then all you do is you change this by making or putting in a minus sign there. So let's first take the case where um, p is is equal to two. So then you can show that this integral is asymptotic to this value here, okay? And this is the case where it's at, uh, where the point of stationary phase is at an endpoint. And if p is greater than two, then you can show that the uh, the integral is um, asymptotic to this value, f of a, this thing which depends on p. So notice that we're no longer going to get um, uh, square root of lambda anymore because we're going to have lambda to the 1 over p power. e to the i lambda psi, um, psi at a plus a phase shift which, which depends on p now. Gamma of 1 over p over p as lambda goes to infinity. So it's fairly complicated, but you can show that this is true. Um, the proof for this, I'm going to skip. So it can be found in the book by Copson. Okay. It's, a, it's an old Cambridge University Press book, um, which is quite nice, but also quite complicated. All right. So that's all I wanted to say about the point, the method of stationary phase. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, any questions before we move on? Okay, so we only applied the method of stationary phase to the Bessel function, but and and in that case, the case for the Bessel function, um, f was just a, a constant. But you can apply this obviously to many other uh, oscillatory Fourier type integrals, um, as long as they fit the theorem the hypothesis of the theorem, I should say. All right, so uh, let's move on then to chapter four. So chapter four actually seems much more complicated because we're going to be interested in um, contour integration, and we're going to be interested in, um, in uh, methods for gaining asymptotic approximations of contour-type integrals. 
So because contour integrations are so much more complicated than real integrals, it seems like this should be a lot harder. But actually, once you get the hang of the method of steepest descent and these contour integrals, we're actually going to convert integrals that look complicated into things which are simpler and can be, and 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 for which we can use Watson's lemma to to do the asymptotic approximation, the heavy lifting. So actually, we're not going to introduce any new asymptotics theory in this chapter. We're only going to give ourselves some theory so that we can reinterpret Watson's lemma to be applicable to a broader class of things. So. Basically, Watson's lemma applies to Laplace integrals, right? And uh, steepest descent applies to Fourier integrals. What I'm going to show in this uh, chapter is that actually Fourier integrals and uh, Laplace's integrals can be viewed in the same way or as the same things, um, just through the just through the um, lens of uh, complex uh, contour integration. They they they're they're basically the two sides of the same coin. All right, so how many of you have done uh, complex analysis or seen contour integration before in some context? Okay, some people uh, learn it in the context of elasticity theory, planar elasticity. Some people who study fluid dynamics learn complex uh, uh, analysis and some complex integration theory because uh, potential theory is based on, at least potential theory in the plane is often ba based on complex analysis. Um, and of course, if you're a student of um, physics, then you study complex analysis in order to understand quantum mechanics and Schrodinger's equation. So it, it has wide applicability. So I want to emphasize that the the treaty or the treatment that I'm going to take here is going to be based on an undergraduate treatment entirely. So the Hoffman and the Marsden and Hoffman book is undergraduate level. And the other book I'm going to use is a, a book by Zill and Cullen called Advanced Engineering uh, Mathematics. And that's also for undergraduates. Yeah, question. So the J integral in elasticity theory is that, that I think that is the bundle integral. Uh, do you remember? I don't know. I don't know. But planar elasticity theory can be studied with uh, complex analysis methods, just like um, fluid flow can be. I mean, it's very kind of similar to the, you know, studying Navier-Stokes or Stokes equation in the plane. I mean, it's not exactly realistic because planar flows and planar elasticity are approximations of uh, three-dimensional flows and three-dimensional elasticity. But um, but uh, at least you can do the analysis uh, in closed form in some cases. But now. Um, so contour integration, I want to argue, even if you've never seen it before, you basically have all the tools you need to understand it because you've probably seen uh, contour integrations of real variables. And you probably heard of something called Green's theorem. Um, and so basically that's all contour integration is, is putting those ideas together. So again, this is my little uh, don't panic uh, uh, preface. So... This is all undergraduate stuff, and I'm going to take my treatment mostly from Marsden and Hoffman. But if you're into, um, um, if you've ever taken a course on advanced um, engineering mathematics, or sometimes uh, it's called uh, uh, mathematics for physicists and engineers, they'll con they'll contain a, a treatment of contour integration. For example, the famous book by um, Arfkin and Weber. Um, that's a, a, a book on, what is it? Advanced Mathematics for Physicists and Engineers. And then there's one by um, Kryzik. So there's lots of books out there for on advanced engineering mathematics or advanced mathem mathematics for physicists and engineers. And they all uh, give a treatment of complex analysis. And the level I'm going to use is exactly that. It's not going to be there's no major theory or anything like that involved. So you see right away, these are things that you um, have probably seen before, uh, but uh, you might have forgotten because calculus three might have been a long time ago or vector calculus whenever you had it uh, is uh, long in your rear view mirror. So suppose that D is a subset of the plane 
So now we're going to start out in the Euclidean plane, okay, an R2. So let me uh, draw a picture here. So there's our set D. We're, we're operating in the Euclidean plane R2. Suppose that D is a bounded open set and U and V are continuous functions. Assume that gamma, actually this is boldface gamma, and uh, it's a function of two variables, alpha and beta, both of which are variables or functions of this interval. And I'm going to think about this interval as a time interval. Okay, it's, it's not time, but it's convenient to think about it as a time. And so this is a trajectory, uh, if you like. Okay, so this is a thing, trajectory, that goes around like this. I think in this case, it's going to be... Okay, so this one is not closed. So let me just... Okay, so there's my curve gamma. Now, gamma has a direction to it. Okay, it starts at this time A, and it ends at this time B. Again, I'm going to refer to this as A, A and B is a time interval. And this curve traces out some path in two-dimensional Euclidean space. You start here at T equals A, and you end up here at T equals B, and it's some path otherwise. Then the contour integral of UV along gamma is defined in the following way. So this is the notation that we're going to define right here. This is the notation we're going to define. That's the shorthand. Actually, I don't find the shorthand to be entirely uh, always useful, but that's the shorthand. That's the thing we want to define, and here's its definition. The definition is the integral from A to B. So we're doing we're going to do a time integral now of u evaluated at remember u is a function as is v from r2 to r2 all right so oh so sorry r2 to r all right, so they are functions which take vectors and map them into scalars. Okay, so that's a scalar valued function of R2. All right, so what I do is I put into its first component alpha. Remember, alpha is the first component of my gamma, and it's a function of t. And the second component I'm going to put in beta. Beta is also a function of t. In fact, it's a function on defined on this interval, a, b, and it maps into d, and this is my set d. All right, and then I have to multiply by d alpha dt, okay? The derivative of this guy with respect to t. v is defined the same way. You take v and you put in as its first argument, alpha t, second argument, beta t, and then you multiply by d, d beta dt. All right, so that gives you a function which is entirely a function of t. It's no longer a function of a vectors or anything like that. It's a function of t. And so I can integrate this on the interval a to b. So that's how I'm going to define this object. It's defined this way. Okay, it's just a defined object. So I could call this one Pringles potato chips over here and say every Pringles potato chip is equal to that. All right, you're allowed to make... In mathematics, you can make any definition you want. This is a defined thing. It has no meaning at all. The only reason this has meaning is because we already know how to do ordinary integrals. Now, I defined this for this curve being smooth it means it doesn't have any kinks in it. Okay. However, curves can have corners and still be okay as long as they are continuous and piecewise smooth then everything I'm going to say is going to go through. However, I'll never um, dwell on the fact that it's uh, continuous and piecewise smooth. I'll always just pretend it's it's smooth and there, thereby avoid a little bit of uh, work. So I'm, I'm being mathematically lazy. Okay, so we're going to keep the simpler, more restrictive case in our proofs. 
But then when we're not proving something, we'll just say this can be extended for gamma being continuous and piecewise smooth. Now, I like to view this, and maybe if you've taken um, another where another another place where you see integrals like this is in um, electricity and magnetism. So for planar electricity and magnetism, complex analysis is again quite useful. But nonetheless, you're oftentimes in uh, in, in electromagnetism, you're going to do integrals of the following form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, suppose that U is actually a vector valued function, okay? which has as its two components, u of x and v of x, all right? So where each one of these is a scalar function, but a scalar function, which is defined on a planar set. So it takes vectors in the plane, maps them to scalars. But I'm gonna put those two together and say that those are each components of a vector. So that gives me what's called a vector function, or this is sometimes called a vector field. Then we can express the contour integral in a com compact form. Okay, so I'm really defining this object here. So what, what does it mean to take u dotted with dx? Well, probably means something like this, right? You have a component of u dotted with the first component of dx. We're going to call that dx without bold. And the second component of dx we'll call dy. And its second component of u is v, right? So this is a nice compact way of saying all that. And how would we define that? Well, we already defined this guy, but you notice that I can compactly write this thing over here, coming from here, just like this, right? So if we have vector alpha of t, beta of t, it's a function of time, what happens if I take the derivative? Well, the derivative just hits both components, right? And so I have right. And now this vector here, derivative, I can just take and I can dot that with this vector u, and you get exactly this. Or well, no, you actually get exactly this. All right. So you can see that this is just a compact way of writing what I previously wrote in the in the yeah. in the definition. Any question? Is that also like the integral for what? Like mechanics. Uh so yeah. let's see. So that's um F, uh, F times the distance, right? Um yeah I guess if I if I make this my my um uh, my length vector so f dot i think it's generally written as something like and, and someone out in uh in uh zoom land can correct me if i'm wrong but i think that's usually written as something like uh dl okay so basically you combine these two things together something similar to it. Okay, so now I made a, a statement about simply connected sets before. And so if you didn't get what I was saying here, I'm going to define this rigorously. So let D be an open bounded set in R2. Okay, so the picture is like this. Now an open set can in general have holes in it. There's nothing wrong with an open set having a hole in it. D is called path connected if and only if between any two points in D, there is a continuous curve that connects them, all right? So this is a path connected set because every, every two points, every pair of points can be connected by a set or can be connected by a path. If I want to go from here to here, say, I have bunch of choices, right? I can go this way or I can go this way to get there. So I can always come up with a path which connects those. That's called a path connected set. Now, if I have something like this, two sets like this, these are not path connected because I can have a, a point here and a point here, and there's no way I can get a path to connect those two points. Okay, no no continuous path can 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 connect those. 
So this one here is not path connected. And this one is path connected. Now, if a set is path connected, we we call it, or let's let's do it this way. Suppose that um, D is an open set. We're going to call that simply connected if it has two properties. Number one, it has to be path connected, and number two, every closed curve in D can be continuously deformed to a point in D. All right. So what does this mean? What is a closed curve? A closed curve is a curve that its start point and its end point are the same. Now, suppose we, we have a, a set with a hole in it, like this guy up here, set with a hole in it. And I have a closed curve that goes around the hole. Okay, can that path, that curve, be continuously deformed to a point? So pick any point that you like. Can I push that curve around? You pretend like it's made of rubber. Can I push it around <clears throat> and move it to any point? The answer is no, you can't because it gets stuck around this hole. Okay. So suppose I want to continuously deform it to this point. I can move this guy a little bit here, move that guy, move that guy, move this one. So I'm pushing the curve towards that point. But in, in the, at the end of the day, it gets, it's going to get stuck around that, that hole. Now, what if I have a set like this and I have a closed path or contour? Okay, can this be continuously deformed to any point? The answer is yes. I can move it bit by bit and slide it. And at the same time, I can contract it. So as I'm sliding it, I'm contracting it. Okay. And finally, I can collapse it down to a single point. All right. So this set has no holes. And that a set with no holes, quote unquote, is one that is simply connected. It is path connected. So every two points have a path which connects them. And if I have any closed curve in the, in the set, then I can deform that curve down to a simple point just by contracting its size and pushing its pieces. So has, has anyone here played with Play-Doh when they were growing up? Or, or maybe um, what's like, well, Play-Doh is a good, it's a, you know, you have these, you, you can roll up a Play-Doh take a tube of Play-Doh and connect its ends and roll it up, right? And then think about pushing in the Play-Doh. Or maybe a rubber band is even even better one. Suppose I have a rubber band, which is really small, right? And I can stretch it out. But the stretched out rubber band can then also be contracted back, not to a point because it has some sort of uh, initial shape, but almost to a point. So that's the sense in which we're deforming curves here. We we assume we, or you can assume you have an infinitely uh, extendable rubber band which never snaps or anything like that, but which collapses down to a point. All right, so such sets for us are going to be rather important. Simply connected sets. So I'll keep saying it over and over again, and and if you like, you can just think about a simply connected set as being a set with no hole in it. Now, a convex set, does anyone, has ever, anyone ever heard, of, ever heard of the term convex set before? Okay, so a convex set uh, has a nice picture as well. So let me draw a set which is not convex, first of all. A convex set is one such that if you give me any two points in it, I can draw, I can connect them with a curve, okay, and a straight line curve. And every point on that curve is also going to be in the set. Well, is this set here convex? I already said the answer is no, because if I have these two points and I connect them with a straight line, then some of the points on the curve are in the set, but there's a broad swath of points on the curve which are not back in the set. A convex set is one which has that nice property that every time I connect two points in the set with a straight line. 
then every set in between them or every point in between them is also back in the set. So such a set is called a convex set. Okay, so this is this W is what I mean by points between X and Y. It has to also be in the set. So every convex set is also a simply connected set, right? Because, um, well, it may, it's maybe not so easy to see why, but, uh, well, from one, one point it is, it has no, it clearly has no holes, right? A convex set can't have any holes in it. And so you can use that to prove that, in fact, it is simply connected. Now we're gonna need Green's theorem. Um, and and so far we're still in real land, but we're going to pretty much we're going to pretty quickly uh, transfer out of real land and into uh, complex variable land. Okay, so for Green's theorem, here's what we need. I'm not going to prove Green's theorem. Green's theorem can be found in many different books. The proof is uh, can be long and complicated, but we're not worried about that here. We're going to assume everything is. We're going to assume everything we need about uh, real variable theory and just prove what we need for complex variable theory. So suppose that D is an open bounded and simply connected set. That's the first point we're going to use that. And assume that U and V are C1 functions that take our set D or take points from our set D and map them into R. So these are scalar functions. Mm -hmm. Suppose that gamma is any smooth, simple, that is non-intersecting, counterclockwise oriented closed curve. I could actually replace this with a piecewise smooth closed curve. So the picture here is this. Here's my set D. Here's my curve. And it's smooth, a smooth curve. And it's oriented in the counterclockwise direction. So this is my set D. In here, I'm gonna define a set D gamma. So D gamma is the set which is defined as everything inside of that, that uh, closed contour gamma. Okay, that's what we call D gamma. Its boundary is the image of gamma. Then, Green's theorem says that the integral, of uh, the contour integral over gamma of this contour integral, remember that's the thing we defined earlier. We defined out, we defined what this notation means. Okay, so you had to multiply by the derivative, et cetera, et cetera. That's equal to the area integral over d gamma, so this, area integral of this area in here, d gamma, of dv dx minus du dy. And you're integrating over the whole area. Okay, so that's that says that, Green's theorem says that you start with a line integral over the boundary, okay? And you can convert that into an area integral over the enclosed um, domain, okay? And you can also go backwards, right, obviously. And it's a kind of integration by parts thing, right? So remember integration by parts shifts you from an integral over a domain to something which has a boundary piece. So you start with an integral over the area and you can shift that to an integral over a domain. So there are lots of integration theorems like this in analysis. Uh, you convert from a line integral to an area integral. All right, so we'll have enough time to just define complex contour integration, and then we'll have to stop because I chatted too long, got too chatty. Um, so here's a con here's what we mean by complex contour integration. Suppose that D is an open bounded set, and F is a continuous function that takes that open set. Now the open set is now not in R two, but it's in the complex plane, and it maps that set from the complex plane into back into the complex plane. That's what we call a complex function, complex valued function. Assume that gamma is a smooth complex curve. So the picture is, here's our set D in the complex plane. 
and here's gamma. Okay, it doesn't have to be closed, so I want to make sure I don't do that. Now I don't put an I don't bolden this gamma in this case because it that's just just the convention with complex valued things. You don't use bold. You only use bold for things that are in R2 in the plane. Okay, so this guy is a path in this set D in the complex plane. And it has to be smooth, okay, in order for this all to work. That is, it has to have a derivative. Well, you don't have to exactly, but um, that's what we're going to assume to make life simple on us. Then the complex contour integral of F along gamma, which is denoted by this symbol here. So that's the thing we have to define. We have to make sense of that symbol. So the symbol is defined as integral from A to B of F evaluated at the complex curve or on the complex curve gamma times gamma prime dt. Now, this still might not make too much sense to us because, well, this is F of, F of something evaluated on a complex line. So this is still complex valued. And if I take the derivative of this complex valued curve, then it's a complex thing. Okay, so there's no dot product here. What I have to do is interpret this through what's called complex multiplication, which we'll talk about next time. Okay, so we'll try to make sense of what this is. This is a sensible object, but if you want to put it back on a footing where you really understand things, we're, we're going to come back and connect this back to uh, real things, okay, or integrals of the uh, purely real type. So that's what we'll be heading for next time. And I'll stop there. And um, if you have any questions, you could come up afterwards or shoot me an email or send over text, but I'm going to stop the lecture there and I will see you guys next time. Otherwise, bye.